Thanks for joining us today on Mormon Land, where we explore news in and about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm Senior Managing Editor Dave Noyce. I oversee the Salt Lake Tribune's faith coverage. I'm joined again by Senior Religion Reporter Peggy Fletcher Stack. Hello, Peggy. Hi, Dave. We remind you about another way to support Mormon Land. Just go to patreon.com, where with a donation as small as $3 a month, you can access transcripts to our podcast, our complete newsletter, and all of our religion coverage. Again, that's Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Mormon land. Now for today's episode. Newly named Latter-day Saint Apostle Patrick Kieran brings an unusual biography to the church's second highest leadership council. A British convert, he joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints at age 26. Kieran has lived and worked in the United Kingdom, Saudi Arabia, and the United States. He does not have a university degree, but having been trained in communication, his speeches are earnest, eloquent, and evocative. He is the second European in the current Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and the third born outside the United States. What will the 62-year-old Brit's background, passions, and personality bring to the apostleship, and how might he influence the global faith? Helping to address those questions and more is Patrick Mason, Leonard J. Arrington Chair of Mormon History and Culture at Utah State University. Patrick, welcome. Thanks, Dave. Always good to be here. So for many close observers, Karen's elevation to the apostle to apostle was hardly surprising. I, I know he was at the top of my list of likely candidates. What did you think when you heard that he was chosen to fill the vacancy left by uh, M. Russell Ballard's death? Yeah, I, I felt the same way. I, I wasn't completely surprised because of his uh his, his previous leadership position, he was in the presidency of, of the 70, which is kind of the third leading uh, level of leadership uh, just beneath the uh, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. And uh, it's been common for for them to to go to that group to select new apostles. But still, there, there are lots of 70s. There were lots of options they could have been looking at. Uh, and and so the fact that they chose him, I was actually quite pleased because I, I mean I'll just say it at the front. I'm I'm a fan of of Elder Karen's and and I thought he was a tremendous choice. And I think he'll bring a, a, just a ton of positive gifts and and talents to to this new role. Yeah, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. I was thinking, what might his selection, along with the the two others previously from President Nelson, Garrett Gong and Ulysses Soros, say about? At least Nelson's what Nelson's looking for in apostles. Yeah, I mean it's 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 hard to know. I mean the the you know the process is fairly opaque. Uh, they don't talk much about you know th that they have a checklist or a job description that that they're looking for. Obviously, they're looking for somebody with with a lot of experience in in the church and in church leadership. Uh, they're looking you know at somebody that they can count on, somebody that they've worked with for a long time. I mean, you know, so it is it is a position of just enormous trust. Uh, and and we know that Elder Karen has had you know positions of significant leadership and trust as as I, as I mentioned. Um, but but I think it 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 does you know the the fact that uh, the president Nelson chose somebody else from outside the United States again I think a lot of people were you know maybe crossing their fingers or hoping for somebody from Africa or Latin America or the Philippines or some of these other areas of, of real church growth and and um, and membership strength outside the United States uh, but 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 still uh, a, a recognition that this is a global church. And and Elder Kieran's international experience is is definitely going to be seen as as an asset there. I would guess that one of the chief things you're looking for, like sort of when a president chooses a vice president in the United States, someone who could be a president of the church, right? Sure. I mean, yeah, because he immediately comes into the line of succession. Now he's at the bottom of that line. He's he's number fifteen at at, at that point, and and. Uh, and so a lot of things would have to happen, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of actuarial tables for him to actually become uh, president of the church. But 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 that has to be part of the consideration. Right. Is 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 this a man who, uh, you know, at least from the perspective of, of President Nelson and other members of the church could potentially that the Lord would choose to become uh, the, the future prophet and president of the church. So, Patrick, have you had any personal interactions with Elder Karen? I have limited. I, I, I wouldn't say we're we're close by any means, but 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 we interacted. Uh, so uh, prior to my current position, I used to teach at Claremont Graduate University in Southern California, and in 2018, 
we hosted a conference about uh, global Mormonism, the, the expansion of the religion all around the, the, the world. And Elder Kieran was actually our, our keynote speaker. And uh, again, he was in, in the 70 at the time. But but this was uh, recently after his experience uh, in which he'd been presiding over the church in Europe. Uh, during the time, if 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 you cast your mind back about a decade ago, there was a huge influx of refugees from the Middle East, from Syria in particular, uh, but other countries as well, into Europe. And, and European countries were trying to figure out how to manage this. And, and the church really made heroic efforts, uh, local congregations and, and the church in general to do this. And Elder Kinneran oversaw that. And I'll have to say, it was one of the most memorable conference experiences I've ever had. So Elder Kieran got up and spoke about uh, uh, refugees, uh, just as he had done at General Conference a couple of years before. And he spoke movingly. He told this story uh, about uh, a girl uh, from from a family. She had uh, walked out the door one day and been shot in the spine and became paralyzed. And so the church provided a wheelchair for her. You know, the church has a massive wheelchair program all around the world. And so this girl who had been so depressed and despondent, you know, I mean, just felt like her life was over. And he talked about how this wheelchair just gave her a, a new lease on life. And, and that was kind of the end of the story uh, as, as far as he was concerned, you know, because she was still in a refugee camp as far as he knew. Well, my, my wife, Melissa, who was there, she wasn't scheduled to speak, but she kind of nudged me. Uh, and and so she went up to the podium and said, um, so, so my wife had co-founded, along with several other women in the area, a refugee resettlement organization in Claremont. And Melissa got up and said, um, Elder Kieran, uh, you know, I was so moved by that story. And about a year ago, we had a family move into this area uh, uh, including a daughter who is paralyzed and is in a wheelchair. And uh, that girl that, that you talked about is this girl that that we've resettled here in Claremont. And she's in high school and she's got a boyfriend and she's so Melissa was working with her and Elder Kieran, because, again, he 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 had no idea about that for as far as he knew that the story just ended in the refugee camp. He he was sitting on the front row and he just broke down in tears, right? He he was overcome with emotion. And he talked later for him, this was just this incredible testimony of, of God watching over all of, of his children, right? That that this elder Karen could have to, could have told the story of any number of refugees that the that the church has helped, but this one girl's story and the fact that she landed there in Claremont. So it, it just showed, I mean, he was so touched by the human component of that. Um, and it, it wasn't just a story. It wasn't just a statistic. Like that was a real person that in his eyes, God had blessed. Patrick, so his Elder Kieran's upbringing is definitely different than many other apostles and 70s and leaders living in various parts of the world and being separated from his parents during for boarding school. How do you think that experience might affect his leadership? Yeah, and then his parent, his dad died when I think when he was nineteen, and that's what led him to to not pursue a college education. So, yeah, I mean he he's had these tough experiences, right? Separation from your parents as a teenager, losing your dad at a pretty young age. Um, I I just think all of that has just conditioned him to have a heart of compassion for other people who who are struggling, other people who are just going through the hard things that that life throws at you. And 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 we've heard that in, in the talks that he has given in, in general conference and, and the times where he's appeared before the church is he just has this kind of ethos of of compassion, of care for the vulnerable, care for the people who are maybe on the margins, you know, that the life is kind of given a raw hand to. And he, um, you know, every time I've heard him or again, in my limited interactions with him, that just absolutely he, he exudes that that kind of warmth and compassion. I was going to ask you, Patrick, a little bit about that. His, his father died in an accident. Yeah, when he was 19. And I guess his brother in law died in the same accident in Arabia. Yeah, uh, something. And, and he and his wife, Jennifer, apparently lost a child in infancy. So he's had his, his share of personal, you know, um, tragedies uh, like we, we all do at point, points. But I, so, I how can an apostles personal experience help shape their ministries? Any examples of say, maybe some other apostles who had things you can tell that happened in their personal life that then reflect in their ministries? 
Well, I I think we we saw that you know with with somebody like um, you know Howard W. Hunter, who was a previous president of the church, and and he grew up you know not in a kind of standard LDS family, and um, you know kind of the stereotypical story, and 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 I think that really reflected in the way that he interacted with other people, with a kind of generosity, a kind of warmth, a kind of recognition that you know people have lots of different life experiences. Um, and, 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 and that really manifest, I, th- I thought in, in his public ministry, um, you know, we, we can think of, you know, just, just recently, several of the apostles and have, have had, you know, spouses die and, and then they've, they've really spoken about how that not only broke their heart, but also opened their heart, you know, to the suffering of other people. I think especially of Elder Neil A. Maxwell, who, who was an apostle, especially in the 1980s and 1990s, he, he got cancer and struggled with that for years. And he really saw himself, uh, he, he spoke openly about that, created a, a kind of new ministry for him, a, a ministry to those who suffer. And uh, and he felt that God preserved his life so that he could, you know, be a more effective uh, in, in terms of reaching out to those who, who deal with things like that. So so th- there's no doubt that, uh, that in a lot of these cases, you know, th- some of the apostles choose to keep those things kind of close to the vest and not talk a lot about their personal lives. Uh, others uh, have clearly used that as a catalyst to think about how they want to serve others. So, Patrick, I, I guess... I guess Elder Kieran's given, uh, I want to say, four, three or four general conference talks and then uh, other talks to BYU, et cetera. Yeah. What are, your, what are your thoughts about him, his speeches, and do any of them stand out? Yeah, the two that stand out to me, I already mentioned his 2016 address in which he talked about refugees. And then he spoke, I believe, in 2022 uh, about uh, survivors of sexual abuse. And you know, it 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 just strikes me, you know, 70s don't get that many opportunities to to talk in general conference. And, you know, now he's going to speak every six months. Right. But as a 70, that's a rare opportunity for the most part. Seven, you know, people are not assigned topics for general conference. So, so they get to choose. He may have been assigned the 2016 topic because of his leadership over what the church did. Uh, I, I don't know about that one way or the other. But and either that way, the week after that refugee program was unveiled, exactly so. Right? So yeah, yeah, his talk and it was coordinated with what the General mm-hmm. Relief Society president talked about. So so that may have been you know kind of coordinated in that way. But still, the fact that he chose to use you know a rare opportunity to speak about refugees to talk about survivors of sexual abuse, right? Rather than like another talk about the word of wisdom or another talk about you know X Y or Z kind of standard topics. To me, that speaks volumes. Like when, when when you don't have to talk about anything, when it's open and you choose to direct your remarks to, to the people who are suffering and struggling and and sometimes are, are not mentioned and talked about from the general conference pulpit, um, that to me just absolutely speaks volumes about who he is. Uh, so Mormonism, Mormonism has a long history with the United, United Kingdom. Even today, two of Karen's fellow apostles Jeffrey R. Holland, Quentin L. Cook, and also, you know, Elder Ballard uh, yeah. served missions in England. Yet church, church growth there is stagnant, if not shrinking. What do you think will be the lasting impact could uh, of Elder Kieran's uh, apostleship for Great Britain? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's such a great question. I and I have to say, I I don't know. I mean, I don't know that. Uh, his calling into the 12 is going to spark a countrywide revival uh, in, in Great Britain. I mean, Elder Dukdorf's calling didn't do that in Germany. Uh, and, you know, those are big structural issues about why religion has organized religion has been on the decline in Europe for for now a couple of generations. And it's not just Latter-day Saints. It's it's every religion. It's it's across the board. Um, and so I. Uh, you know, I, I do think, you know, he, he'll bring some particular insight about that. The church doesn't want to give up on Europe. It continues to build temples there. It, you know, it's uh, so it's not abandoning the continent, clearly. Um, but just structurally, I mean, that that is uh, uh, Latter-day Saints and every other uh, church are definitely rowing upstream when it comes to try to, to tailor the message to, to Europeans, to Western Europeans right now. So. 
we already alluded to this a little bit, but but where where Patrick Karen came from in the church hierarchy that he was, I think he was serving as the president of the yeah, president, the senior the president, yeah. yeah, and and others have come from that that upper echelon, uh, you know, Ronald Rasband, Christopherson, Quentin Cook, Neil Anderson, Uchtdorf. But not all choices were coming through that. But but is that emerging as sort of the farm team for apostles? I, I think that's one of them. It's it's definitely yeah. It's probably the AAA team. Um, you know the the other place where uh, where we see several have come from is the presiding bishopric, which I think sometimes gets forgotten, but is actually a really important body of church leadership. They oversee all of the church's finances and and temporal affairs, and so so at least two or three of the current apostles have have come through the presiding bishopric uh, as well. So I, I think those two places, the presidency of the seventies, presiding bishopric, are you know when we look look at future uh, apostles, you know, uh, when you put your bets in Vegas on who it's going to be, uh, you know, that's y- you want to look at the, those two two leadership bodies. Yeah. You know, uh, we uh, across from my mind of Gerald Kotze, of course, is the who is the president, who is the the chief bishop, uh, the presiding uh, bishop, uh, the presiding yeah. bishop, Rick. Yeah. And he's was in his or he's like 60. He's so he's his mm-hmm. age. He's not tremendously he was from France, also a European. But, but it seems like that might not be the right choice at this time with all the church focus on the church's wealth. Well, yeah, I mean, the optics you know there what might, I mean? might have been, <laughs> been, been a little tough. Uh, I, although I do think, uh, I mean, for, for me, Bishop Cosse was kind of in my top three to five of, of potentials because, mm-hmm. again, he's he's somebody that clearly that the first presidency has a lot of trust in and has uh, taken on a lot of big responsibilities. Yeah, the, 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 the PR part of that would have would that would that would have been tough. But you're right. They uh, sort of seem to like to have apostles in that mix that have served there who know that turf. And you, and know you need to, mean? right? I mean, mm-hmm. the, the, the apostles, the you know, the first presidency in the Quorum of the Twelve, yes, the, the, they would say their primary mission, of course, is to be ministers of the gospel, to be witnesses of, of Jesus Christ, to preach the gospel and administer the church. But administering the church includes overseeing this massive worldwide operation, right? We know in the hundreds of billions of dollars and, mm-hmm. and all. So you got to know, you, got, you have to have people in that senior group who know money. Uh, I mean, uh, so uh, you don't appoint a whole lot of history professors, you know, to, you know, to, to, to boards, you know, with, with that kind of finances. And so, so it, it makes a lot of sense to me that there should always be at least two or three, if not more, of of the men in that that role who really understand complex financial organizations. But Ronald Rasband, even though he wasn't in the presiding bishopric, he you know he made you know head of a major international corporation. You know Gary Stevenson, also extremely successful in business. It just makes sense because the church has never just been a religious body; it's always had this significant temporal uh, or financial aspect as well. Also among the 12 have been former university presidents. Yes. So we have Jeff Holland, Dallin Oaks, David Bednar. Uh, and now we have Kieran, who doesn't have a college degree. Yeah. I find that interesting. Do you? I, it's, it, it is fascinating because you you, you look at the, the formal educational attainments of the current form of the 12. I mean, Elder Gong, the PhD, right? I mean, you know, these are highly, highly educated men, way above the 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 average uh, you know, population. Uh, and again, you know, these these are men with tremendous leadership skills, a lot of competence to be able to 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 run complex, uh, a complex organization. Um Elder Kieran is no slouch intellectually. I mean, you you can just tell, and it's not just because the British accent raises everybody's IQ like ten points, but um, <laughs> but uh, but he he he's an extremely intelligent guy. It, it just shows that you know a, a PhD or a college degree is not the only path to to intelligence and, and competence in, in life. And I say that as as a university professor. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we already talked a little bit about his speeches, particularly about the refugee crisis and abuse, and they these speeches have won him wide pra- praise among many quote progressive Latter Day Saints. But some ultra conservative members who are talking about him in forums see him as a quote lefty European. Do you think this perspective will change when he becomes when he is an apostle? Yeah, I mean, it's yet to be seen. That that, that I, it, there's no way he 
got uh, appointed to this if he were some kind of you know radical leftist. Uh, that 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 just doesn't doesn't happen uh, in this church at at, at this moment. Uh, and so yeah, might his his views about I have no idea of his politics. I mean, literally no idea of his personal politics. How how he votes? I be, is I don't even know if he's become a U.S. citizen or if he's still a British citizen. Um, but uh, uh, so. But but, you know, this this is where sometimes, you know, we, we want to see everything through the lens of of politics, partisan identities, cultural ideologies, you know, those kinds of things. But but, you know, virtually, you know, everybody in, in that senior leadership, of, of course, it tends conservative, just like the church has tended conservative, you know, leaned conservative for the past several decades. Um, but it's they're generally centrist. Um, you know, uh, so if if and it's a big if if he tends to be somewhat uh, on the left just because of his European upbringing, of course, Europeans are generally more liberal than 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 Americans. It would it would be at most a kind of center left uh, w- within American politics. So I'm and I'm not even sure he I, I haven't seen anything from him that that's even the, the right set of lenses to to even talk about him. Of course, we all want to talk about it because politics overshadows everything. But I haven't seen any signals from him one way or the other uh, in, in in that regard. So uh, religion news service columnist Jana Reese has, has sort of speculated that Karen's experience in public relations may help the church mend some of its image problems. Uh, we talked about abuse. We talked about the church's finances. Do you see that as a possibility? Does that that the church need help in that area? Well, <laughs> I, I I think it does. I, I I think it'd be hard to say otherwise. Just you know, but it always does. You know, every big organization like Google needs better PR. You know, uh, right now, I mean, uh, the federal government needs better PR. I mean, the, the White House, everybody, and so it's it's a constant issue for these big sprawling organizations, uh, and so. Clearly, having you know more expertise in that senior leadership role is is, is not going to hurt. Of course, they have tremendous professionals, you know, who kind of do the work of public affairs. Um, but having somebody in that room, in that senior leadership room, who maybe raises the question of like, okay, what's this going to look like from a communication standpoint? What's what's this decision? How do we talk about this? How do we frame this in in the best way? Uh, oftentimes, it's not just what you do, but how you communicate it, yeah. and and. And so, so if if he's a voice that that can provide some experience along those lines, I think that would be welcome. Of course, he'd have to be put in a position where he'd have more direct input too. I suppose, right? You know. Yeah, and, and of course, we'll see what his um, assignments become. Right. That all of the assignments are assigned to, uh, and he he's at the very bottom of the totem pole right now. Mm-hmm. So he'll be the junior partner. Most departments, when the church ha- have uh, two apostolic advisors, a senior and a junior member, so he'll be a junior member of of the you know of advising you know multiple church departments it'll be interesting to see what his assignments uh become uh Jeffrey R Holland the new president of the quorum or acting president of the quorum will make those assignments um but uh uh yeah so, so, so we'll see what kind of opportunities he has and and we know that it's a seniority system uh he is not the leader in the room at, at this point he is he is the junior guy and they tend to be deferential to the to their senior uh to the senior leaders so with uh, President Russell M. Nelson's three picks, Garrett Gong, Ulysses Soares, and now Kieran, the church, the quorum seems to be evolving away from multi-generational Latter-day Saints. You know, people, men with uh, pioneer heritage of some sort. How how are these three picks? Would you, would you, how do you see them changing the church? Well, it's especially striking because he replaces Elder Ballard, who was the clearest connection to Joseph Smith, uh, mm-hmm. because uh, you know he was a descendant of Hiram Smith, Joseph Smith's brother. Uh, yeah. So yeah, this is very much a swap out there, just in terms of personal backgrounds and histories, and it reflects. You know, Elder Kieran looks more like the the, the church than Pioneer Stock does at, at this point in terms of the global church. Um, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of people around the world will be able to resonate with somebody who joined the church in, in his 20s. Uh, and, uh, and and so he'll be able to relate to other people that way. I thought it was, that, that was one of the striking things I thought about his 2016 talk about refugees 
is, you know, for me, the money line was their story is our story, right? When when we look at refugees, that 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 was us, you know, uh, 150, you know, 200 years ago. And um, but that wasn't his ancestors, right? He, he doesn't come. He, he doesn't have a great, great grandma who crossed the plains, right? But this is one of the things that religion does. This is one of the things that Mormonism does is it brings people into stories, right? It, it, it brings, you know, you, you, it, the theological term is sort of being adopted in to these kinds of stories. And lots of converts feel that, right? It's like, I'm not just joining a church. I'm not just signing up for an organization, but I'm becoming part of a story uh, that's bigger than me. Uh, and and I th- and I think that's really remarkable. And I think Elder Karen will be able to to resonate with a lot of people who 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 feel like they want to adopt this story, but also some of the cultural aspects still seem a little weird, right? Um, uh, you know, Elder Karen's been in Utah now for several years because of a ch- his church assignments, but he's not from Utah. Uh, Elder Suarez is not from Utah, so so some of these kinds of Utah isms that find their way into into Mormon culture, it you know uh, it's. I, I think Elder Karen will have a different relationship to those kind of cultural aspects of the religion than somebody, you know, who's born and bred and, and part of pioneer stock. Well, speaking of cultural traditions, many have noticed that Elder Karen doesn't use his middle initial. <laughs> Might that change the pattern of saying apostle names? In- Nor does uh, Elder Suarez. Yeah. All right. So it's, for a uh, long time, Dieter Uchtdorf didn't either. Somehow that F got. That it, it got smuggled in there yeah. uh, to, yeah. to, to differentiate him from all the other Dieter Uchtdorfs in, in church <laughs> leadership, right? <laughs> uh, uh, so, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how, how that goes, you know, and, and maybe this is a tiny little public relations thing, right? That uh, that, that middle initial just doesn't play, you know, so it, it, in the same way it was John F. Kennedy, you know, it was, you know, at the same time that it was David O. McKay and things like that. But it's just Joe Biden right now, you know, and and. Uh, and and so the culture changes just in terms of how leaders present themselves to the public. Maybe this is some tiny little signal of of what that might look like. It does seem like the the initial thing might have initially been because of all the Smiths. Oh, I, I think clearly, yeah. There I mean, so many Smiths. Joseph Smiths, Brigham Young, John Taylor, Wilfred Woodruff. Those men did not go by middle initials, but then the Smiths got it all confusing. So again. A small thing, like you say, a tiny thing, but maybe this does signal fewer Smiths, fewer multi-generational members and more global, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, non-traditional in the Mormon sense of it. Yeah. Move. Yeah, and, and it'll be interesting, you know, at at at, uh, at some point in the future, there'll be an Asian apostle and 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 or other places, you know, where just names work a little bit different, you know, in terms of some, for in a lot of East Asian cultures, the 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 family name comes first, right? And so, you know, so the church as it grows and matures, and as we see more and more leadership from more places around the world, we'll just learn that that some of these naming conventions are are no more than just cultural uh, traditions. So one final question, Patrick, I have to ask. Do you see him as another Dieter Uchtdorf? It seems like he's he's cut from a similar cloth. Uh, and uh, again, just, you know, where where you come from, where you're raised, the experiences you have, that, that just matters in terms of how you see the world. Um, and Dieter Uchtdorf is no flaming leftist, right? Uh, but he is, you know, he's he's more European than 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 somebody born and raised in in, in Utah, and so that does that does change, you know, just your your kind of overall orientation to the world. Now, th- these are all men who have traveled a lot; they've seen the world and so forth. But but those formative years, who you are, who who you, who you were in school with, and in, in your teens, in your twenties. Um, you know, that that does we know from lots of studies that that just absolutely shapes how you see the world really for, for the rest of your life. Patrick Mason, thanks for joining us today. Hey, thanks. It's my pleasure. Happy holidays. And to you, too. Thanks to Peggy Fletcher Stack. Always a pleasure. And to our producer, Christopher Samuels, we remind you that you can keep up on all the happenings in and about the church by subscribing to the Salt Lake Tribune's free Mormon Land newsletter. Just go to slcrib.com to sign up. And we'll talk again next time on Mormon Land. Mormon Land.